Friends, welcome to worship with First Presbyterian Church on this Lord's Day. We are grateful to be gathered together through the technology and the live stream. We are grateful that God continues to gather us and be in our midst, even while we are separated in this time. Friends, let us set aside all of the worries and the cares of this week that has passed and focus our attention and our hopes and our hearts on God as we join together in these moments ahead. Friends, let the hearts of those who seek the Lord rejoice. Let us worship God. Let us now turn our hearts towards confession, knowing our need for grace and confident in God's forgiveness. Let us pray. God of mercy, we confess that like the disciples, like so many who have come before us, we set our minds not on divine things, but on human things. Doubting your loving care, we grab for more than we need. Doubting your loving purposes, we shrink from living as your followers. Doubting your loving plan, we become stumbling blocks in your creation. Forgive us that we may gain new life in you. For it is in Jesus' forgiving name that we pray. Amen. Friends, the promises of God's love and mercy are offered to us on this day and every day. Friends, believe the good news. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. In Jesus Christ, we know God's forgiveness and God's peace. 
At this time, we invite you to share the peace of Christ with one another. We are seeking to be more interactive with one another, and we in hope that you might type your passing of the peace into the comments. You might share that peace with one another, and we'll seek to um, call your names and call peace uh, out to each of you. So friends, may the peace of Christ be with you. We see that KC is with us and we say, peace be with you. Peace be with you, Kay and Elizabeth and Mary Margaret. Peace be with you. Peace be with you, Jeff Stimson. We're glad that you are worshiping with us today. Tanya and your family, we are so glad to say peace be with you. Larry, peace be with you as well. And Jan, peace be with you, friends. Hi friends, in today's Bible story, we hear God talking to Moses out of a burning bush. God is telling Moses that he needs to go tell the Pharaoh, the king of Egypt, to let all the Hebrew slaves go. And Moses doesn't seem super excited about that project right to begin with. He argues with God a little bit saying like, um, why me? Why do I have to go? Or how will I even know what to say? But we know that in the end, God goes with Moses and helps him be brave and guides him and tells him what to say. And this business of God going with God's people and guiding us does not stop at the Bible times. And so to begin to think about that, how God's guidance goes all through the ages. I'd like to read you a book this morning called Moses. When Harriet Tubman led her people to freedom, and this is written by Carol Boston Weatherford and illustrated by Kadir Nelson. Moses, when Harriet Tubman led her people to freedom. On a summer night, Harriet gazes at the sky and talks with God. I am your child, Lord, yet Master owns me. He drives me like a mule. Now he means to sell me south in chains to work cotton, rice, indigo, or sugarcane, never to see my family again. God speaks in a whippoorwill song. I set the North Star in the heavens, and I mean for you to be free. Harriet sees the star twinkling. My mind is made up. Tomorrow I flee. God wraps her in the blanket of night, and she returns to the cabin, sleeps beside her husband one last time. The next day, Harriet tells not a soul her plan. She grips the axe to chop wood, breathes deeply, and murmurs, Lord, I'm going to hold steady on to you. And God whispers back in the breeze, I am going to see you through, child. At dusk, Harriet chants, When that old chariot comes, I'm going to leave you. She hopes her loved ones hear her song and know it means farewell. While the plantation sleeps, Harriet prays, Lord, send me a sign. Owl screeches. The hour has come. Harriet slips into the night. Running through the swamp, she hears frogs croaking and her own heart pounding. Lord, I can't make it alone. In the moon's reflection on the creek, she sees God's face. 
Harriet, you dream that saints saved you, but mortals will give you refuge. The woman in the wagon who always spoke kindly to me. Yes, Harriet, I must go to her. The woman points Harriet to safe havens, hiding places for runaway, and Harriet steals away into the darkness. In a clearing, the safe haven, Harriet knows that most strangers would turn her in, not help her, but the farmer's wife feeds Harriet and then tells her to sweep the yard. I don't know who to trust, Lord. Search for my face in theirs and for my hands in their work. A boatman rows her upriver. Back on shore, hounds snarl and sniff for Harriet's trail. She races as fast as she can. Lord, I can't outrun them. God speaks through a babbling brook. Shed your shoes, wade in the water to trick the dogs. Upstream, the barking ceases and fear washes away. Thank you, Lord. Harriet's feet bleed and her gut churns. Under the stars, she draws near to God. Lord, don't let nobody turn me around. I'd rather die than be a slave. Harriet, keep going. You have already glimpsed the future. She recalls dreams she had where she flew like a bird, sank, and was lifted by ladies in white who pulled her north. Fly, Harriet. Your faith has wings. When Harriet is about to drop, a couple in a wagon ride by. They say, slavery's a sin, and they take her on the last leg of her journey. Not far now, child, not far now. In the promised land, Philadelphia, the sun shines gold in the trees, and Harriet feels light as a cloud. She studies herself from head to toe to see if she has wings. Is this heaven, Lord? Not heaven, Harriet. Free soil. But freedom brings new woes. Harriet is hired as a servant. Lord, I'm a stranger here. All my kin are down south. Would you like to see them? As Harriet dusts, her family's faces appear in the wood grain. She wipes a tear from the table. I would make a home for them here. I would give my own life to free them. Then go back for them, daughter. But first, go to my house to prepare for the journey. And Harriet goes to church, finds not just holy ground, but a stopping place, a station along the Underground Railroad that slaves travel to freedom. Harriet hands out shirts and shoes, serves butter beans and biscuits to newly arrived runaways, while agents who plot escape paths pass on secret routes that she learns by heart. Finally, she's a conductor, a guide, and she turns to God. I am ready, Lord, lead me. Harriet, I will make a way for you. And Harriet heeds God's call, goes south again and again, keeps her bands of runaways moving, come storms and rough country, clear to Canada, Canaan land. And when free souls sing her praises, she gives glory where it is due. It wasn't me. It was the Lord. I always trust him to lead me. And he always does. What a story. The bravery and faithfulness of Harriet Tubman really comes through, doesn't it? And what else comes through is God's faithfulness. God is with Harriet every step along the way. Sometimes God is a comforting or strengthening voice, and sometimes God appears through other people who help Harriet. This week, I hope you will remember the stories of Moses and Harriet Tubman. And think about times when you may have been worried or scared or not known what to do. As you look back on those times, can you see now how God was with you? 
Did you find comfort in praying and talking to God? Did God appear through other people that helped you? It can seem like we're living in a pretty scary time right now, and it's important for us to remember that just like God was with Moses and God was with Harriet, God is with us still. Let's close with a prayer. Holy God, who wraps us up in love and is as close as our breath coming in and going out. We thank you for guiding Moses and Harriet Tubman. Let us feel you with us so we won't be afraid. Guide us in your ways of love. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. The scripture for this morning is from Exodus 3, as we continue the story of Moses. Exodus 3, 1 through 15. Listen for the word of the Lord. Moses was keeping the flock of his father-in-law Jethro, the priest of Midian. He led his flock into the wilderness and came to Horeb, the mountain of God. There the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a flame of fire out of a bush. He looked, and the bush was blazing, yet it was not consumed. Then Moses said, I must turn aside and look at this great sight and see why the bush is not burned up. When the Lord saw that he had turned aside to see, God called to him out of the bush, Moses, Moses. And he said, here I am. Then he said, come no closer. Remove the sandals from your feet. For the place that you, on which you are standing is holy ground. He said further, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And Moses hid his face for he was afraid to look at God. Then the Lord said, I have observed the misery of my people who are in Egypt. I have heard their cry on account of their taskmasters. Indeed, I know their sufferings, and I have come down to deliver them from the Egyptians and to bring them up out of that land to a good and broad land, a land flowing with milk and honey, to the country of the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites. The cry of the Israelites has now come to me. I have also seen how the Egyptians oppressed them. 
So come, I will send you to Pharaoh to bring my people, the Israelites, out of Egypt. But Moses said to God, who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the Israelites out of Egypt? He said, I will be with you, and this shall be a sign for you that it is I who sent you. When you have brought the people out of Egypt, you shall worship God on this mountain. But Moses said to God, if I come to the Israelites and say to them, the God of your ancestors has sent me, and they ask me, what is his name? What shall I say to them? God said to Moses, I am who I am. He said further, thus you shall say to the Israelites, I am has sent me to you. God also said to Moses, thus you shall say to the Israelites, the Lord, the God of your ancestors, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob has sent me to you. This is my name forever, and this is my title for all generations. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable in thy sight. O Lord, in whom we live and move and have our being. Amen. Running away from a self-created mess and the oppression of his people, Moses tries to find a simple life, settling down with his wife Zipporah, shepherding in the mountains. But God never lets us go that easily. When there's something to be done, God calls upon us to act. God seeks Moses out. This familiar story of the burning bush captures our imagination. God speaking, urging a leader forward. There is the reverence of holy ground and a God who hears the cries of the oppressed. This story holds mystery and promise. Throughout the stories of the Bible, when God calls someone for a particular task, people reject that call. Moses does the same. Who am I to take up this task, he asks. But God gives him reassurance as God tends to do. Reassurance that I will be with you, even when it gets hard. Now, note that the reassurance from God isn't necessarily that it's going to be easy or that you will always be successful, but that God will see you through this. When, God, when Moses sees this burning bush in the midst of his daily tasks, he moves closer and listens. In that listening, he hears God's voice. Now, God instructs Moses to remove the sandals from his feet. This gesture is an ancient practice when entering a holy place of divine presence. It is a gesture that honors the holiness of the ground, this mountain, and the God who is speaking. It's a show of reverence, and this practice is still used in Islam and other religions and cultures. Taking off one's sandals or shoes is a gesture in many cultures that... Uh, is associated not only with entering a worship space, but also entering a home. Here, at the foot of the mountain of God, Moses is invited to see the holiness of the space. Might we feel a sense of that awe that overcomes 
Moses. As God shows up at the end of an ordinary day. This is what God does when God shows up, transforms ordinary moments and ordinary things into the holy, claiming a space as holy. This fire that is burning highlights God's voice and shows Moses something maybe he's walked past a hundred times, but it's all different now, filled with fire, filled with a message of hope, a message of liberation. Reverend Jan Richardson, a minister, artist, and poet, she writes of this burning bush in a poem called Blessing at the Burning Bush. Part of that poem, it struck me, it says, on an ordinary day, when you are minding your own path, bent on the task before you that you have done a hundred times, a thousand, you will have to choose for yourself whether you will attend to the signs, whether you will open your eyes to the searing light, the heat, whether you will open your ears, your heart, to the voice that knows your name, that tells you that this place where you stand, this ground so familiar and therefore unregarded is in fact holy. In thinking about this pandemic time, I'd love to know what you are finding previously unregarded, perhaps new spaces, new spaces that you are seeing in new ways. Is there a particular place in your home? I know these months, in these months spent so much there that you may have come to appreciate something anew now that we're spending so much time in our homes. Please go ahead and share what that is with those around you. Type it into the comments. What has become holy ground for you? Or if not holy, but new, a space of new appreciation for what we've had all along. I know for me, I've seen my porch in new ways, come to appreciate it and the chairs we sit on as we've spent some time there watching the world go by. My young son, Arthur, has become a very good porch sitter in these days. What part of your shelter-in-place residence have you come to appreciate the most? Are there any special places that you now enjoy more readily that you didn't notice before? For me, there's this window that I appreciate now more than I ever have before. Before the pandemic, I used to love writing sermons in coffee shops where I could hear the buzz of people. And I look forward to doing that again so much when it feels comfortable and safe to return to those spaces. But in the meantime, I needed to find a new creative space, a writing space. I found a desk and I put it facing outside a window on the, in the guest room of our home. And while it's not my beloved coffee shop atmosphere, I've been enjoying looking out this window with my desk up next to it. I've now come to notice neighbors walking for exercise or walking their dogs at particular times of the day. What about you? Is there a chair or corner or part of your home that has somehow become more noticeable, even sacred? during this time, a mini retreat in the midst of all of this. Next week, as we celebrate the sacrament of communion together, we will again ask you to transform your space into holy ground, the ordinary bread and cup becoming the bread of life and the cup of salvation, our ordinary tables becoming holy. We've counted on the way that the ordinary can become holy during this time of pandemic and isolation. Each of you are joining us from a sanctuary made up of your homes. 
on your kitchen table or your couch, from your phone or in front of your computer. This space, this time has been transformed into holy space, holy ground. I remember a speaker at a youth conference long ago talking about holy ground being this space, this distance between you and me that is holy. When we are in conversation, when we are in community, this space between you and me is holy. And this space nowadays is so much farther, six feet at least and more. And we invite God to speak to us in this holy space to continue to burn in our hearts, to continue to call to us and speak to us. And we must do more work to listen now at this time because our regular routines that help us get ready to encounter the holy are changed. The spiritual discipline of church attendance, of singing in a choir, of table hospitality, all of these are interrupted and changed, and it's so much harder to see those burning bushes now, those ways that God is speaking to us even still. KC read a story about Harriet Tubman in our children's moment, who was nicknamed Moses as she led many people to freedom out of the bondage and horrors of slavery in our country just a few generations ago. Harriet Tubman had a strong faith in God. The 2019 film Harriet portrays this as almost an open dialogue with God, where God warns her of danger before it happens through particular visions. There's a powerful scene where she's down on her knees in prayer, and the people that she is leading are asking, what, what is wrong with her? But her brother says, she's talking to God. And she then gets up and continues to lead with confidence, assured of the way that God is leading and speaking to her. Now, there are several scenes where at a crossroad, she pauses and listens for a moment, deciding where to go next. Another scene, a friend of hers, Marie, is asking her, how is it that you have been touched by God, that you talk to God? She says that she listens, and sometimes it's clear and loud, and other times it's more of a gentle urging, the way that God is working or speaking. But she says that you have to listen and you have to act. You can't hesitate. You have to pay attention and you have to focus on God. You can't second guess it. Our, call, our calls from God are not as clear as from a burning bush. The invitations that come to us are not as plain or as clear as Harriet's visions and guiding seem to be the way that she heard God speaking to her. But even so, God helps us do hard things. Each of us may not see the flame of God so clearly about our daily tasks, but when we stop to listen and examine the holy space among us, we might be surprised at where God is telling us to go. The burning bushes can be difficult to perceive in the midst of a pandemic or a hurricane or the pain and shock of violence and lives cut short by shootings and gun violence. Events happening nationally and internationally or right in our very own homes sometimes obscure God's voice to us. It can be hard to stop and to listen and to hear God speaking in the cacophony, speaking to our hearts in the midst of it all. May we ask God for vision to see what is ours to see and courage to do what we can do to align ourselves with the God of justice, the God of hope, the God who hears the cries of the oppressed 
The God who topples the angry tyrants and lifts up the lowly. God speaks to Moses and gives him comfort and encouragement and courage in the midst of his doubts and fears. He doesn't think he is the one to help God overthrow this tyrant, but God says you are. Like our mini drama and conversation with God last week when the midwives were asking God to stop this evil that's happening in their midst, God reminds them that they have the ability to stop the violence that's happening around them. When we see hate in our midst and lives being snuffed out coolly and casually, we must speak out. When a cold-hearted boy walks down the middle of a street with an AR-15 and kills two people and then casually drives home, you know something is wrong. We know that God is not a Democrat or a Republican. God is not an American. God has no flag. But what we know is this, that God is on the side of the oppressed. We know this to be true, that God is on the side of the vulnerable. God works to bring those in bondage free through sometimes messy leaders and messy movements, but we know this to be true, that God sent God's only son to speak words of love and healing and inclusion and hope. And yes, Jesus was killed by the state, was executed by those who couldn't stand that he was trying to disrupt the systems of power that sought to keep people oppressed and complicit. We must listen for that same God now in these times because God continues to speak still, continues to speak in this time. And as people who believe in a God who is good, a God of love, a God of that beloved community, we must work to stop racism, to stop gun violence. We must stand up to the systems in which we are complicit, systems that are stacked against the poor, systems that keep people without means or resources in the same cycles of poverty over and over and over again. Friends, when we are too comfortable, let that be a red flag that we aren't paying attention, that we aren't doing enough. Let that be the times when we look for the burning bushes all around us and open our eyes to the injustices of our society. Friends, what is it that is speaking to you now in these days? What is it that is calling your heart. I pray that this time that we spend together today and each week in prayer and discernment and song might inspire each of our own sense of call from God. And know this, the one who calls us walks this journey with us. In that call, may we also hear the voice that says to us, I will be with you. May it be so. Amen.
friends, we have a few announcements for this morning. And um, the first is a few, uh, a few opportunities for connection and conversation in this week to come. I, if like some of you, I, like me, I found it so hard to be and feel connected in this time. And we offer a few spaces to connect throughout this week. The first is via a Zoom coffee hour conversation check-in that will happen immediately after the conclusion of our worship service at just about noon. Um, you can find uh, the details for logging in on our website at uh, on the front page there, First Presbyterian firstpresmemphis.org and um, we hope that you'll join us through that Zoom to just check in and say hello uh, to one another um, in, in that space. We also have on Tuesdays our weekly conversations uh, about the anti-racism policy of the PCUSA. This week, even if you haven't um, been able to join us before, we hope that you'll consider joining us uh, this Tuesday at 1215. Um, we do a 45-minute conversation. Hopefully, it can fit into the space of your lunchtime. And this week, we'll be focusing on... Um, immigration and incarceration and um, the way those impact uh, the community, uh, the communities of color. And um, we just hope that you might consider joining us um, on for that conversation. And then on Thursday afternoons, we have a Bible study at uh, 3.30 p.m. On those days, we, we discuss and we pray and we discuss the scripture that will be upcoming for the following Sunday. So that we hope that um, we commend that to you. Hope that might enrich your experience of um, the worship um, on Sunday as well as uh, spending time together in community, um, in conversation about the scriptures. If you have other announcements, we invite you to go ahead and add them to the comments now. If there are things you'd like to have in our weekly newsletter, our weekly e-bulletin newsletter, um, please uh, email us at the office or email Chip, and um, we can get those into the weekly newsletter uh, so that we might uh, continue to stay connected and, and know what's happening um, in our lives. If you're looking for a way to serve or get involved in um, our outreach ministries, know this, that we continue the Soup Kitchen weekly. Um, we are serving the soup in a to-go, a soup and lunch in a to-go model. We also have our Second Harvest uh, grocery delivery where we um, give bags of groceries to um, our neighbors in need and also our closed closet ministry is operating in a to-go model. Um, if you'd like to figure out how to plug in and help with those ministries, please um, either email the office, email or call me or talk to our outreach chair, uh, Jamie, about how you might plug in and help um, with these ministries. We also um, are accepting particular donations uh, uh, for different various clothes, clothing items, um, and you can talk to Callie, who leads our clothes closet ministry, about that. Um, and we would love to have your uh, your prayers, your participation, um, in in whatever way feels comfortable and and safe with uh, for you. So, with all of that, we. Uh, we know and that God continues to be present in this time, in this space, and we, um, we now seek to bring our offerings to God. God, uh, God blesses us with so much, and we ask that in, uh, in response and in gratitude we might return a portion of what God has offered and provided to us um, in offering. Let us pray. Holy God of holy ground, 
like Moses, we so often question our fitness or ability to serve your purposes here on earth. We ask that you overcome our qualms with your assurance, with the assurance of your presence. Bless our offerings on this day that through them we may continue to do your will in your name. We know that you are a listening God who heard the prayers of the Israelites. We ask that you hear these prayers now, both spoken and silent. We pray, O oh God, for peace where there is conflict and division. We pray for food and nourishment where there is hunger. We pray for hope where there is despair. We pray for health where there is sickness. We pray especially for the recovery of Vicki Fertel, and we pray for Tony's mother, Anne Marie. We pray for those battling the COVID-19 pandemic illness, for those healthcare workers who seek to bring your healing. We pray that you inspire faith where there is so much fear. We pray all this in the name of Jesus, who conquers all that would defeat us and offers us new life. We pray with the prayer that he taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. glory great things he has done so loved he the world that he gave us his son who yielded his life an atonement for sin and opened the life gate that all may go in praise the lord praise the lord let the earth hear his voice praise the lord praise the lord let the people rejoice. Oh, come to the Father through Jesus the Son and give him the glory, great things he has done. Great things he has taught us, great things he has done, and great our rejoicing through Jesus the Son. But purer and higher and greater will be Our wonder and transport when Jesus we see Praise the Lord, praise the Lord Let the earth hear his voice Praise the Lord, praise the Lord Let the people rejoice Oh, come to the Father through Jesus the Son And give him the glory Great things he has done
Friends, go out into this day and look for those burning bushes. God speaking to you on this day and in the days to come. And as you go, may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord be kind and gracious to you. And may the Lord's face shine upon you and grant you peace on this day and forevermore. Amen.